The stock market rebounded nicely today. In fact, we were able to basically eliminate all of yesterday's losses. Much of the enthusiasm today was based upon what else but China and the United States getting a little bit closer to that phase one portion of their deal and hopefully delay some of those tariffs that are set to take place on December 15th. So we're going to take a look at all of that to see how it affects our posture. I can tell you that the Dow Jones Industrial Average that I hinted at in last night's presentation was the first to go to a bearish posture. The other three indices still stay with a bullish posture for now, but we're going to keep our eye on that. And then we're going to take a look at a trade application example from the financial services sector. And I want to focus on kind of a higher volatility type of a play to take advantage of some of that increasing VIX we've been seeing lately. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Market Outlook video presented by MarketScholars.com. I'm your host, Brandon Van Zee. It's December 4th, 2019. First off, if you're new, welcome aboard. Remember to go to YouTube, click subscribe. While you're there, check out our description, sign up for our email distribution list. We're also heavy users of Twitter. My handle is at Brandon Van Zee. And I certainly appreciate those of you that click like and retweet whenever we post these Market Outlook videos on Twitter. Lastly, we have a presence on Facebook. Feel free to join our group there at the web address embedded in the logo in front of you. All right, let's go ahead and dive into the charts. As you can see, I've got chart 4B pulled up here in front of us. And uh, as a reminder, we're looking at the four major US equity indices here. And let's start with what I mentioned in the intro, which is right here in the upper right. Dow Jones Industrial Average was the, was the first uh, index to go down uh, and hit the mat, so to speak. You can see here that uh, we now have this pink background color uh, that signifies we now have a weekly bearish posture on the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It's not strongly bullish, so uh, there are plenty of times where you know those uh, signals are fleeting at best. Uh, in fact, these most recent ones right here can remind you that when we have these signals and they're occurring right around the moving average, if the path of least resistance is to the upside, oftentimes that gets resolved back to the upside as well. So I wouldn't read too much into this yet. Obviously, it's worth noting, which is why I'm pointing it out now. One thing can certainly lead to another in these markets, but um, what we should know right now is that, hey, there's been a little bit more of a uh, of pressure on the Dow Jones Industrial Average, kind of like I was mentioning in last night's video. Part of that is uh, due to what's going on with the, the trade uh, wars and how a lot of those big multinational companies that are part of the Dow Jones would be impacted much more so than smaller companies. Uh, so you are seeing that uh, wear and tear on the Dow Jones there with now a newly minted uh, weekly bearish posture. But price is still above a rising moving average. So uh, there is that. Uh, yesterday, I couldn't have made that claim. Yesterday, uh, we still had a bullish intermediate posture according to the market forecast, but price was actually below the moving average. With today's move higher today of 0.53%, we're back above the moving average, but now we have that bearish posture to contend with. So a uh, little bit of a kind of a mixed signal there, as it were, with the, the Dow Jones. The other indices uh, continue continue to maintain their uh, bullish posture from an intermediate term perspective. The S&P 500 was up 0.63% today, effectively gaining all of yesterday's loss back, and we're right back to where we closed uh, on Monday. Uh, same thing can be said down here with the NASDAQ. We were up 0.54% on the NASDAQ, and then the Russell 2000 was our big winner here today. It was up 0.7%. And as I mentioned in last night's presentation, it's kind of been interesting that the Russell 2000 kind of seems to be uh, more stubbornly bullish right now than some of those other areas. And that hadn't always been the case in 2019. But here's another case in point where it did lead us here today. Russell 2000 was up 0.7% today and uh, has a nice little bounce characteristic to its chart there uh, as well. So we'll keep our eye on all of those. Remember, when those green lines fall out of the upper reversal zone, that's when we get those bearish postures and as you can see with the remaining three charts all of them are on the precipice of going to a bearish posture so if we do have uh, some downside action later on this week uh, do not be surprised at all if you end up seeing some bearish postures that join the Dow Jones for right now uh, we'll give them the benefit of the doubt and we'll see if this bounce here today can lead to anything more constructive and maybe they'll be bailed out uh, but right now uh, obviously we do have a little bit of a loss of momentum of the market compared to what we were experiencing in most of uh, October and November let's go ahead and take a look at our three green arrow status now 
And as we look at that, as a reminder, the background colors here will signify whether we have three green arrows, three uh, red arrows, or a mix of green and red arrows. Right now, we actually have mixes on all four of our charts. I mentioned in last night's presentation that the only holdout there was the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which had a three red arrow signal. But with today's bounce by a half a percent higher, we're back above the moving average, and therefore that red arrow on the moving average just turned right back to a green arrow one day later. So we still have the red arrows on the MACD and the stochastics, but as long as price is above that moving average, it will retain that green arrow right there. So that's the only thing noteworthy that I uh, needed to share with you there. Otherwise, uh, it's pretty much status quo, exact same presentation uh, that I mentioned from last night. Let's go ahead and take a look at the 1040 crossover briefly as well. And again, not a whole lot to uh, talk about here because this remains the same as what we saw yesterday. Uh, we do have bullish postures across the board from this longer term view here. In fact, that has been the case for really the last four or five weeks when we got this final bullish posture on the Russell 2000. And the others have been bullish posture from this longer term, less sensitive approach, uh, really for the better half of 2019. So not a whole lot of surprise there on that longer term view. So then let's go ahead and turn our attention attention to the 12 grid analysis starting with chart 5A and this will be our asset class 12 grid. So as we look at this uh, you can see some interesting uh, movements here today. I wanted to uh, point out this one in particular down below. Oil uh, actually had a nice little rebound here today. You'll notice that the background color of the oil chart is still that light pink telling us that we have a weakly bearish posture. It's not strongly bearish, it's weakly bearish. So there is some constructive behavior taking place here on the chart, but it's not enough to actually turn the posture around yet. I would imagine that's got to be on the horizon here in just the next day or two uh, if crude oil can maintain this strength because we're very close to kind of breaking out of a multi-week range here on USO. We're right back up to that resistance area that we found, you know, at the end of November. So, uh, you know, we don't want to just completely discount that. Uh, there could certainly be some sellers uh, setting up shop right there. Uh, but right now, that was a pretty furious rally we had there uh, with USO today. And I would anticipate us flipping to a bullish posture on oil here reasonably quick. Uh, I, I also know that the from a sector perspective, XLE or uh, the energy stocks in general were the leaders within the marketplace here today. Um, in terms of interest rates, we did see a pop back higher in interest rates today. I mentioned yesterday that we closed at basically at 1.7 on the 10-year treasury yield today. Uh, rates closed at 1.78. Interestingly enough, REITs actually went up today. Now remember, that's not typical. What we saw yesterday was typical, where REITs were up because interest rates were down. Today is less typical when we saw real estate investment trusts go up despite the fact that interest rates were also going up. So we'll have to see where that takes us. Remember, uh, we do have, I think it's a bear call spread, I wanna say, on, on VNQ for these presentations going. It is still sitting here just directly below its falling moving average. And as you can see from the background color of the chart on VNQ, it is still considered strongly bearish at this point, despite the rally of the last two days. So we'll have to keep our eye on that. It was quite peculiar to see REITs up today on a day when interest rates were up uh, pretty dramatically as well. Now, when we start looking at some of these other areas uh, of from a macro perspective, let's talk about kind of this top rung here in terms of the stock markets around the world. You can see that the United States appears to be the strongest area of the world right now. If you were to look at it through the lens of posture that is interpreted through the market forecast technical indicator, because the S&P 500 still has a strongly bullish posture. Whereas EFA, which is the developed foreign stocks, um, they have a weakly bearish posture, and EEM has a strongly bearish posture. It's kind of interesting here. We don't see that very often, where with these three charts at the top of chart 5A, 
all have a slightly different shade to them. Usually stocks kind of go up together and they and stocks go down together. But right now we're starting to see a bit of separation out there. And right now it appears that the United States has a leadership role from a global perspective. And then the developed maybe European and uh, Japanese and, and Australian areas of the world in the developed markets uh, are com kind of coming, coming in next. And then China, India, you know, Brazil, that sort of uh, you know country is going to be, uh, you know, uh, pulling in the, the as a laggard here currently now of course that's going to change and that's the whole point of us having these videos on a daily basis things do change and, and it's our job to point those out to you so if that does change in the future we'll let you know but right now it does appear that those emerging markets are the ones that are struggling uh, right now let's go ahead and get into that conversation a little bit more detailed by coming now over here to chart 5 E, and this will be our global stocks primary 12 grid. So these will be some of the largest economies uh, on the planet. And so as we look at this, you can see that the only other economy that has a strongly bullish posture out there along with the United States on this view is Japan. Uh, and uh, remember, Japan would be part of what I mentioned a moment ago, uh, developed foreign. And as you can see, Japan had a really nice bounce today, exactly what you're looking for, kind of sticking with the trend, right? The idea there being that once prices come back down to that rising moving average, it uses it as a launch pad higher, and that's exactly what we found here with Japan today, similar to how it uh, did the same thing back here at the beginning of October. So that's a good sign. Japan remains in a strong uptrend, and that has been the case for much of the last several months. You know, time and time again, whenever I view this uh, portion of the, the presentation, I've been pointing out that Japan is one of our leaders right now. Now, there's been other leaders that I've been pointing out as well that have kind of come and go by the way side, but uh, Japan seems to be kind of a consistent theme of strength that's out there. Now, one uh, quick little uh, you know, point of note where unfortunately I have to kind of throw a little bit of a wet blanket onto that uh, exciting commentary right there, and that is Japan now has what is known as an overbought cluster signal. Now, before we uh, think too much of that, I will remind you that the last time we had an overbought cluster signal, it did not seem to affect this particular chart. Remember, just like any technical indicator, there are going to be some charts that respond to technical setups and other charts that do not. So in this particular case, I don't want to outright dismiss it because I've seen too many times where, you know, those cluster signals can point out interesting topping zones. But what we have experienced with Japan specifically in the past does not suggest that we should just completely get out of our Japanese securities right now if we are in them. We kind of want to let that uh, work to see if it's going to, you know, perhaps uh, blow off a little bit of steam by just going sideways and not make the assumption it's just going to crash from these levels here. You know, from my perspective, you know, when price is king, uh, you can see it's still firmly embedded within that series of higher highs and higher lows. I think you still want to be uh, lean a little bit more bullishly on Japan rather than bearishly. But uh, we'll keep our eye on that cluster signal there. And, you know, if that leads to uh, more destructive price behavior going forward, uh, we'll do our best to point that out for you. The only other chart on the board that even shares any bullish posture is down here in the lower left-hand corner. That's Brazil. Um, that one does not have that darker shade of green. Uh, it's that lighter shade of green, and therefore we would consider that weakly bullish posture. So it's not strongly bullish because it's not above 50. In this case, it's 34 and rising. But uh, it's worth noting that, hey, there's at least been some strength there that you might want to take note of. And remember, that wasn't always the case either. Uh, Brazil has kind of been, you know, dancing to its own tune, so to speak. And it's kind of been going up and down at times when the rest of the markets around the world are doing the opposite. So uh, it's been a little bit peculiar from, from that perspective. What, what I can say right now is it is promising to see that Brazil has gone up you know, basically five days in a row right now, and we now find ourselves right back up to that moving average. So maybe it can build upon this and uh, show us a, a little bit of a, a, a bounce higher from these levels. In terms of the, the uglier looking charts on the board, you know, I would say that it's probably a mix between China and South Korea. You can see both of those charts are concerning because not only do they both have that dark pink background telling us that we have a strongly bearish posture on them, but they also both have 
this red moving average right here. Notice the tip of South Korea right there, the tip of China right there, both red, telling us that price is now below a falling moving average. A lot of times that moving average can be used as support as long as the moving average is going up. But as soon as the moving average starts reversing and going lower, oftentimes the moving average then starts becoming resistance. So it starts changing the shape uh, and the expected uh, movements going forward of those securities. So be a little bit more cautious around China and around South Korea. But of course, keep in mind that those are big exporting nations and a lot of uh, their you know, stocks are probably tossed around daily based upon what the headlines of the news suggest regarding trade wars during that particular moment in time. So you know, if all of a sudden uh, you know, we're all singing Kumbaya and uh, the world opens its borders and you know, tr trade is uh, you know, passing through the borders freely, uh, I, I would imagine that those exporting nations would probably benefit if that were to occur. I'm not saying it will, but you know, just a, a reminder that news can affect these exporting exporting nations in this environment we find ourselves in right now, much more so than in other environments. Let's look at the secondary 12 grid of the foreign nations now, and that will be chart uh, 5G in this case. So these will be some of the smaller economies then, um, but as, uh, is the, as was the case on the last set of the 12 grids, we have kind of a mixed bag here right now. Uh, the stronger areas appear to be uh, Turkey and Switzerland. Those are the two that have those dark green background colors right there. Of the two, uh, I think what interests me of the two when I look at them is the Switzerland bounce that we're getting today. Um, now remember, Switzerland would be part of the developed uh, foreign markets, whereas Turkey would be part of the emerging foreign markets. And uh, back to what I was mentioning earlier about EFA versus EEM, if you want to think of that perspective as well, then perhaps Switzerland uh, would, would take a, a slightly higher ranking in your mind in terms of bullishness as a result. But I do like the way that that is bouncing off of that rising moving average there on EWL. Um, you know, and, and some of the other areas that we've talked about with the second uh, 12 grid in the past that had been our leaders and our stalwarts have started to see a little bit of slippage. Taiwan was one of those alongside Japan that I would regularly point out in recent months that was just kind of on a one-way freight train up. And that has kind of started to change shape here more recently. Notice that Taiwan has largely gone sideways for the last month. And while we remain above a rising moving average at this exact moment in time, we have had an overbought cluster signal recently that does bring in a little bit more concern. And as you can see, the background color of the chart is now that light pink color telling us that we have a, a, a weekly bearish posture right here. So a little bit of a mixed signal there. You know, until it starts trading dramatically below the moving average, I still want to give it the benefit of the doubt considering we are in a seasonally strong period of the year for equity markets. Uh, but, you know, obviously, if you've had a long trend trade going on Taiwan for the last several months, as we've been pointing this out, you're going to want to start kind of adjusting your expectations perhaps going forward as it looks like it's kind of stalling out here and there is a bit of a loss of momentum there. So that's kind of uh, what, I, what I'm seeing from the secondary markets. Another thing I should point out is Mexico did have some oversold cluster signals here recently. So we talked about this overbought cluster signal on Taiwan. Mexico has kind of been the opposite where Mexico's chart has fallen so dramatically. We now have these oversold cluster signals that have been popping up in two out of the last three days. And um, you know you can see the stock market in Mexico was up today to kind of offset those oversold cluster signals there. Uh, but right now with this dark pink background color and this red uh, moving average line, I would assume that that is going to be acting as resistance going forward. In fact, wouldn't be surprised at all if that ultimately became a big you know, head and shoulders type of a formation uh, there in Mexico. So uh, make sure that uh, you stay vigilant there if you have any uh, Mexican securities that you are trading. All right, um, with that out of the way, let me take a brief moment just to pop on over here to the internet and say thank you to those of you that clicked like for me yesterday on Twitter uh, regarding this Market Outlook post. Uh, we got up to 107 of you that were willing to take the five seconds out of your day to click like, and I do appreciate that. Uh, as I mentioned, um, you know, it helps David and I know whether 
uh, we are being effective uh, with presenting this material and whether it's useful to you. Obviously, uh, we don't want to just uh, go out and, and speak to nobody. Uh, it really wouldn't do us any good since it would be wasting our time. And since nobody would be listening, it wouldn't do anybody else any good either. So uh, the way that you can let us know that you listen to these presentations and that you appreciate them is just take the five seconds out of your day and click like for us there on Twitter, uh, which is the social media platform that we use the most often. So it's kind of uh, used as our barometer or our judge of whether these uh, videos uh, are being well received by our audience or not. So we do appreciate that. Also, uh, earlier today, I taught my swing trading class. That uh, class is now posted uh, where we talked about our um, most recent bounce setups that we're seeing from both a bullish and a bearish side of the equation. David had his advanced option strategies uh, where he talked about inventory trading uh, that you're welcome to check out as well if you're a premium member of Market Scholars. On tomorrow, uh, we do have our uh, question and answer session. So my question and answer session will be at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, that'll be for about two and a half hours. Uh, so I usually uh, go that long as long as I have the energy and feel up to it. But uh, we generally have more than enough questions to get through. So uh, feel free to join me for that if you have an interest in that sort of commentary. Uh, otherwise, for those of you that are managing your portfolio through the use of ETFs uh, with some of those country ETFs that I just mentioned a moment ago, uh, that's David's class that will be teaching tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern time. So make sure you're taking advantage of that as well. All right, let's now pop back on over here to the Thinkorswim platform and uh, we'll talk about our trade application example here for the day. So I'm going to go ahead and I guess we could probably just pull up, let me see a swing trading chart here real quick on uh, AXP is the, is the stock I want to talk about here today. So as you can see, this is a three month chart of American Express. And it's been a market underperformer for the last three months. You can see that the S&P 500 is up here and its price candles on AXP are down below it. So it has not fared as well as the S&P 500 over the last three months. In fact, where we find ourselves right now is kind of in the middle of the range. Now, one thing I wanted to point out to you on this one, which is something that you can kind of try to hope to identify in the future, is notice that all of our market forecast lines are huddled up there directly in the middle of the indicator. Now we've talked about the concepts of having those lines huddled up down below the lower reversal zone or up above the upper reversal zone and creating those cluster signals in those extreme levels. This is the opposite of that. They're, they're clustered up, but there's no extreme anywhere. Uh, in fact, this is largely just considered a sideways chart. You know, if you look at where we're trading right now, it's almost dead smack in the middle of the, the high and the low of the last three months. So when you see that type of behavior, it's telling you that there's mixed signals out there. The bulls aren't really dominating the trading action, but either are the bears. They're both kind of allowing uh, each other side uh, to win a few battles here and there, but nobody's really winning the war. Uh, we're just kind of grinding sideways there uh, for this particular uh, security. And you can see that it kind of did that a little bit back here as well, where those lines were largely kind of stuck there in the middle. And since then, the stock has largely gone sideways. So until we see a breakout one direction or another, one way to try to take advantage of a neutral chart like this would be to sell an iron condor. Now there are better times and worse times to be considering selling iron condors. One thing you have to be aware of when doing it on an individual stock like American Express is that they can have an earnings announcement that can take a perfectly steady chart and you know, basically make an, uh, a big move up or down as a result of the earnings announcement. Well, this stock already reported its earnings, so we don't have earnings coming up on it uh, anytime soon. Um, and the other thing that you're gonna wanna kinda ask yourself is, where are we at with volatility right now? And as I mentioned in yesterday's presentation, the VIX actually had a pretty strong upward trajectory for the first couple of days of this week. And when that occurs, volatility levels across the board start pricing those options contracts a little bit more expensive than they might have been the prior week. Now that can be a bad thing if you're somebody that's buying premium, but it could be a good thing if you're somebody that's selling premium. And remember when you're selling an iron condor, that's effectively what you're doing. And so I've already got the trade kind of selected here on the trade tab. What I'm gonna use is the January 
uh, weekly contracts. So this is the January 3rd weekly contracts that expire in 30 days. A lot of times with these credit spreads, we look for that 30-day um, window as kind of our sweet spot in selling. So that's one of the reasons that the weeklies were attractive. But quite frankly, the, the other reason that uh, I, I decided to go that direction as opposed to the monthlies is that the weeklies allow for dollars between the strikes. If you went out here to the monthly contracts in January, you'll notice that there's $5 wide between the strikes, and I just wasn't able to get it exactly the way that I wanted to. With this particular trade, I felt like it was an interesting setup. Now, one of the things that you'll notice down below as you're looking at the strikes that I've selected with it is that we're only doing $1 wide vertical spreads here. Now, that used to be a bigger concern than it is now. Remember, most discount brokers, at least here in the United States, have gone to a commission-free uh, mentality. In other words, it doesn't really matter how many contracts you're doing, uh, there's not going to be you know, a so-called uh, ticket charge. Now, every bro broker is different, so you do have to make sure you check in with your specific broker. But let's just say that commissions are reduced significantly from where they were uh, in the past. And so it does open up that possibility of doing $1 wides a little bit more often than you might have been willing to in the past. Now, you'll notice here that the strike that I selected to sell on the call side of the equation was the 123. And then I'll be buying the 124 call to complete that portion of the iron condor. On the sold put side of the equation, I'm selling the 111 and I'm buying the 110. Now remember, the bought portions of this uh, trade are there to protect us in case we are dramatically wrong and something you know big happens to the company. Maybe it gets a buyout offer, or maybe you know it gets investigated for you know uh, fraudulent behavior, and that can have an erratic movement, of course, on a stock price. And so you do want to protect yourself to a degree, and that's the nice thing about an iron condor. It's not going to be a perfect trade by any means, but at least you do have defined risk embedded within the trade itself as a result of those long calls and long puts that are embedded within the uh, four different uh, legs of this particular trade. Now you'll notice here that I'm getting about 23 cents for this particular setup. Generally, we shoot for about a 30% return on risk. Now one way that you can, you can check those numbers yourself is simply click confirm and send once, get your calculator out, and then take your max profit, in this case, we're just doing one contract as an example purposes for education, um, $23, divide that by your max loss, in this case, $77, and you'll notice that our return on risk is 29.87. So in other words, if you just round it up a touch, it would be a 30% return on risk there. So anyway, you'll notice here, it also shows you where your break even prices are on this trade. $110.77 and $123.23. So let's take a moment here to draw those on the chart just to give you a sense of how much wiggle room you'd be giving yourself with a trade that is like this. So let me get a drawn item out here and we'll just do a price level and let's just draw one price level kind of up here at the top and let's draw another price level kind of down here at the bottom and I'm gonna right click on that upper one and click on edit properties and I'm gonna change this to the break even that we saw just a moment ago of 123.23 and then hit okay. And on the bottom side here, I'm gonna right click on that, go to edit properties and I'm gonna to go to 110.77, hit okay. And as you can see, that uh, kind of sideways channel that you see right there drawn by uh, those dotted blue lines represents where our trade can be on expiration day where we can still expect profits. So this is a trade that's considered a neutral trading strategy where you'd want the stock to stay below this upper bound here and above this lower bound here. And if that can happen, then you should make money on your trade. Now the nice thing about this particular setup is you'll notice that the upper band is here above the highest level that AXP has traded in the last three months and the lower band is below the lowest price it has traded. In other words, if you expect AXP to stay within the same range that is traded for the last three months for the next 30 days, then this could be a profitable trade for you. 
Now, on the other hand, if you thought that we were going to get a big rally up or a big, you know, drop from here, you're probably not going to want to take a neutral trade like this. But uh, if you have no reason to believe there's going to be extreme movement and you're just trying to take advantage of some of that higher volatility that we've seen this week, then perhaps this would be one way to try to take advantage of that. So let's go ahead and come on over here to the trade tab and we'll click confirm and send. We'll ship this off to the market and we can see if we can get filled first thing in the morning. All right, well, thank you for joining me here yet again. Remember that the stock market still is largely bullish with the exception of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which did flip to a bearish posture as of today. We'll continue to monitor that situation. A lot of this will depend upon what sort of news headlines hit the market on that particular day. But one thing we are fairly confident in saying is that the path of least resistance continues to be to the upside. Obviously, the moving averages are still trending higher. So we're going to have pullbacks along the way. That's perfectly normal for the stock market. And it's up to us to try to take advantage of those opportunities when they present themselves. So I want to thank you for watching tonight. David should be back with you tomorrow. I want to wish you all the best of success with your trades and your investments. Goodbye for now.